Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll try to wake everyone up from their lunch stupor, as it were. Um, so I'm going to start with quite a bold statement, and I think a lot of people in this room would, would agree with that, that there's not a single protected area, game reserve, or park that has played a more important role in the conservation and management of white and black rhinos than Shishlugu and Fulazi Park. <laughs> so congratulations, guys. Take a bow. All right, so the thing is, is that this... This really stems back quite a ways. So you, you have seen this map, uh, I'm sure, in a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different talks. And we'll expand on that. If we take a look historically, one of the key things about this is that when these two reserves, Shishlui Game Reserve and Fulozi Game Reserve, were first declared in 1895, making them two of Africa's very first game reserves, the last remaining population of white rhino was found between the white and black and Fulozi rivers, which is now the modern Fulozi Game Reserve, the Fulozi section of Shishlui and Fulozi Park now. We're unsure of the actual numbers of black rhinos within the park. Um, however, they were there, and we see that, especially when we take a look at what happened in the 1970s. By the 1970s, the white rhino population has grown to approximately 2,000 individuals, and black rhinos are sitting in greater than 300. So this, uh, these numbers have increased. This is a conservation success story. Okay? And with that, we see that during a time period where other populations across other parks were either extinct or declining or not growing, these two populations within the system are increasing. Now, like I said, this is a conservation success story. With conservation success comes conservation challenges. And in the case of, of white rhino, it was the impacts. During this time period of the 70s was the idea that, or, or the perception, that white rhinos were impacting the soil and the plants. Okay? So what we have is a conversion of tall grasslands, areas of Thermida erigrostis being converted down to grazing lawns. All right? We also see, a, within these, an increased erosion. Okay? So we see that, yes, there's a reduction in these, in these grasslands. These are not all that good at preventing the removal of soil through wind and water. And we see an increase in the overall erosion gully. And some other gentlemen here will, will uh, attest to that. During that same time period was the concern of that the impact that this would have on other species. Okay, yeah, everyone talks about elephants, how ah, they shove over trees and they damage, they can convert, change um, grass, or woodlands to grasslands. But you release high densities of white rhinos, they remove all the grass layer, this causes greater erosion, the trees fall over because they don't have any soil. Impacts of white rhino are much greater. In contrast to this, in a different story, the black rhinos didn't have the same sort of situation. We see that there's an initial increase in individuals, but then a decline in the 60s and 70s, um, where in 1961, 46 individuals, black rhino in the park died. No real understanding why. Okay? It's not poaching. Then we see that there's a regrowth until the 1990s, and during the 1990s, another apparent decline. This seems to actually be looking at the data. Again, the study found that it's probably due to a, uh, a violation of the assumptions of marker capture techniques, and it may not have been a real decline. But whether it was an artifact or reality, it still initiated concerns about the health of the population within the park and whether the habitat actually really was that great. Now, some of this stuff has been alleviated, but what we're seeing is two completely different situations with these two species. Around this time also came fantastic uh, um, creation or modification or adjustment is basically the improvement of live capture of large mammals. Now rhinos could be captured in large numbers safely and transferred out of the park. This was a win-win situation for the, for the park for quite simply the fact that now white rhino population numbers can be reduced and reduced safely. In, a sec in addition to that, because they can be transported out, these populations can act as metapopulation. Uh, and start going into metapopulation uh, conservation even before these, these terms are really kind of uh, brought in. This really comes around through the, the removal of these animals, reintroducing um, re, uh, them into regions where they had been historically but were gone, restocking individual or reserves that had low numbers. Okay? So from 1960, what we're seeing is that over 4,500 white rhino have been removed from the park and more than 250 black rhino have been removed. Okay? These have been shipped to other reserves, to zoos, to all over. Okay? But how do you determine how many to remove? This has been the concern and the management that's gone on. If we take a look at white rhinos, the white rhino population was basically done initially from 1962 to 1977 by tracking rainfall. Okay. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a dry year, remove a lot. Next year's uh, the rainfall the rainfall's fine, I don't worry about it. What this resulted in is these huge, big up and down kind of removals of peaks and troughs related to it. 
in many ideas, in many ways, this gut feel that's led to this. But then in 1978 and 19, to 1986, a shifting towards estimating a carrying capacity for the POC. I see that there's some people in the audience. If you have this reference that's at the bottom, please post this on to me and also to management staff within within Shishlui. This is missing, so we don't actually know exactly how this carrying capacity was, was estimated or actually what it was. We just see it referred to in Martin Brooks's work. But during this time, actually early in this, Norman Owen Smith, as has been mentioned, was doing his PhD. He went along and said, okay, well, actually, to reduce the impacts that rhinos are having within the park, what we need to do is reduce the biomass. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by simulating or facilitating the natural process of population regulation of large mammals, which is dispersal. Okay? And what he said is, okay, Go ahead, do this. We can target this. This will have a couple benefits. Right? It's going to reduce numbers, but it also is going to adjust the dynamics of the of the pop. And what we see is that it took a while for this to happen. Norman talked about this in the 1970s, um, and it wasn't until 1986 that this actually instituted. Okay. So what did Norman actually suggest? Well, Norman suggested reducing the population by five percent per year. All right. This was the proposed. What he actually observed in the park, the white runners moving between the sections, is anywhere from about 2.4 to 3.5 percent. So the projected or the proposed removals was just a little bit greater than the, the natural dispersal that went on. What you then see is he said you need to target the subadults. If you target the subadults, these are the individuals that are dispersing, this is their mechanism, these are the guys that leave. In addition to this, you now have a situation where you target an aspect of the population where you get the greatest bang for buck. These are the natural dispersers. It's also going to adjust the age and sex profile to where you have a more stable type of situation. One of the problems is the park was closed. The fence, the rhino-proof fence surrounded the park. Rhinos can no longer disperse out of it. Many of you are familiar with the starts of Operation Rhino in the 1970s, Ian Player and all this. Those rhinos that were first removed were ones that were already out of the park. They weren't removed from within the boundaries of the park. They were removed from outside. Now you've got this entire population trapped. Okay? How do we do this? How do we facilitate a natural dispersal mechanism or a natural um, population regulation or mechanism within a closed park? Well, Norman said, we need to create two areas. We have a core, a high-density area where we leave the rhinos alone. And we and create, in and amongst these, or sinks, low-density areas to where animals can disperse into. Then you target those individuals that disperse into them. Right? This is the, the basis for the sink management policy of today. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight some of that as well. Okay, so here we go. This is the, um, you see Shishlui on Halsey Park, the map here um, on the right. It's just a uh, blown-up version of Mphilosi. What you have is a central core area. That central core, the population is left alone. Populations increase, natural behavior takes place, territoriality, home ranges, all that's left alone. Surrounding that on low-density sinks. There's a number of different types of sinks. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of all of this. But the basic idea is, is that this is a low-density area. A nice benefit or added additional benefit. It's around the border. It helps with security. Okay, lowering numbers. As density of rhinos in the core gets great, as now competition, as food availability goes down, or the behavioral mechanisms that drive dispersal kick in, individuals move from the core into these sinks. Once they're in the sinks, they're able to be removed. And they go in, game capture goes in, removes these individuals. The nice thing about this is that it's a natural process by which individuals are telling management, there's this many, too many of us in the park. If you find 50 rhino in the sinks, guess what? There's 50 too many rhino in the park. Okay? It's not a thumb suck. And this is fantastic when we look at it that way. Black rhinos are different, though. Okay? The idea of management of black rhinos is not through population reduction. We're not dealing with a huge number of individuals that are damaging the environment. Okay? Basically, what we see is that Jushlinian Filosi is a core population. It's a core population for metapopulation expansion. Individuals are taken from HIP and used to establish and create new populations. Right. This is about a 5% population removal over time, okay. or over per year. The idea is, is this kicks in density dependence, uh, or releases density dependence. You lower your population, and then what happens? It booms, man. There's space, there's resources available. Individuals can move into areas. They can take advantage of this. You'll get um, uh, younger individuals breeding, a greater calf survival. You get um, shortened intercalving intervals. The population should respond. And then you can remove more individuals and ship them out. So you keep a healthy, growing population. 
It differs to the white rhino population or the management because removals are across the park. Here, the white dots are removals. You see you have concentrated removals in some areas and few removals. Also, what's different is the fact that the requirement of the, the individuals that are removed are not those natural dispersers. It's determined by the requirements of the receivers. No one wants to go along and say, sure, I need six black rhino. They go out, find the ones that have dispersed, and congratulations, you have six males. What good to me is that? I want a growing population. What's six males going to do? So what you find is that removals are targeting things like females or maybe older males or maybe subadults, prime individuals that are breeding to help create and start those populations. So this is not natural regulation. Unlike black rhino, unlike white rhinos, which is natural regulation, black rhinos has a very different type of agenda. So what we see is that these two species management is dealing with different strategies and different objectives, yet they both rely heavily on density-dependent regulation, reactions to this. You create low-density areas, individuals move across into it. You reduce area individuals within that population, you open up space, you open up resources, they respond. In addition, our behavioral response to density. Movements into low-density areas or, or colonizing opened up spaces for black rhinos. So has it been successful? Well, if we take a look at the white rhinos, what about dispersal? Have individuals been dispersing into these vacuum zones? Yes, for approximately 29 years. Every year animals are removed. Every year animals move from the core into these sinks. Okay? The nice thing about it as well is that that central core, the population is left alone. It goes, it goes along, it increases, and it's never manipulated. Okay? So the natural processes remain within the majority of the rhino population. In addition, the individuals that are leaving are the ones that would have left anyways. And so what we see is that natural selection is kicking in. The individuals that are leaving are not the ones that are chosen by management. I take that guy and that one and that one. It's, not that. it's people like, oh, look, are the ones that are in the sink? Remove them. Okay? In addition, what we're seeing is, is that from the 70s, those concerns of erosion and habitat impacts are gone. No one's talking about this. No one's talking about the fact that, geez, look at the huge erosion problems we've got in the park. Okay? This, the system is kicked in, and what you find is not only heterogeneity in spatial density of white rhinos across the park, you now have heterogeneity in vegetation. Areas of high utilization, areas of lower utilization. What about black rhinos? Well, what we find is that there's been relatively large removals of the black rhino population within the park. And this has led to a gradual reduction in population size within the park. We're down to about 200 black rhino within the park now. But what happened to density dependence? Come on, we were supposed to remove these animals, freeze up space, why aren't they responding? Why aren't they booming? Why isn't the population climbing and that it's, things are going well? Well, there's a few potential reasons for this, and this is where I think the, the challenges and the opportunities that go along with this lie. First thing is, is that recent studies show there's actually limited dispersal back into an open area. You move a black rhino, there's a gap, there's resources, there's space. Two years down the line, no one's there. In fact, what's happened is you remove a male, all the females that were around it start to move away. You remove a female, males around it start to move away. And so this space isn't being utilized by individuals that are there. Okay? Another problem is the predators. When you take a look at populations that have fantastic black rhino growth, they have a lot lower density and number of predators. Okay. Within uh, HIP, you have lion, you have hyena, and there's a potential that they are actually influencing and attacking those, those black rhino cults. And so growth rate is reduced and cost survival is not as high as what it could be. Another thing, it could be capture bias. Spatially and also targeting specific groups, by targeting these individuals, you could be reducing the breeding potential of the pole. Where yes, if you randomly remove the individuals that needed to move, they're not actually going. Okay. Also, there could be breeding uh, disruption. By removing male from an area, the females don't have anyone to breed with, they're moving on. And so the capture bias and the slow reason, the slow um, uh, movement of these animals actually makes it to where they are not actually responding how they how we think that they should. Also, something that's not looking at, what about foster, the foster response from competitors? You remove a black rhino from an area, there's a browser. What about the other browsers in the area? Are they benefiting now from this increased space, increased food availability? Are we seeing a response from these guys being quicker than black rhinos? Slow reproducers. Okay. So that we see that there's a number of challenges here, a number of things that are looking at it. And what I think we do, I only have one minute according to my clock. What we're looking at here is that 
we have a situation where the we sit to the same place we were in 1986. 1986, a very bold move was taken to use an ecological principle to manage white trial, to use a natural mechanism. We now sit with a bunch of potential questions that are maybe preventing, what's actually preventing this, this change in, or this lack of change in response to density dependence. We now could actually go along and design removal strategies that still achieve the target of removing individuals from the park, but do it in a manner that explores these different potential uh, causes. Thus, Shishli and Felizzi is already at the, at the leading edge of uh, white rhino conservation. We now have the possibility to push it to where black rhino conservation and management follows right behind. Thank you very much. Thank you.